Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, maybe even good night. You are present at the Nature-Based Solutions Challenge and we welcome you all. We have a lot of speakers today and um, you, what you can expect is that we will explain you more about the challenge that we are organizing. And furthermore, we want to really inspire you with some examples of nature-based solutions. The program of today, my name is Miriam Troost. I work for the uh, student challenge team at Wageningen University and Research. After we, we will have Tim van Hattem talking. He's um, a project leader at nature-based solutions at Wageningen University. He will introduce the challenge further and he will also talk about nature-based solution research at Wageningen University and Research. Then we have the speaker Saroy Yakami. He is uh, working for Meta Meta and he will talk to you about green ro roads for water, really an inspiring um, example of nature-based solutions. Then we will have Avi Fett with us. She is the UN Youth Representatives for Biodiversity and Food for the Netherlands. And she will talk to you about nature-based solutions and youth. After that, we will have a questions and answer about the challenge and the presentations and a closure. If you have questions or remarks, we want to ask you to use the chat. Uh, we will uh, look at it during the event, but also after at 24 to, fi uh, to 5, all the panelists will be present to answer your questions. Furthermore, we will uh, launch some polls and you are very much invited to participate in this. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about the challenge itself, uh, some highlights. Uh, we, we are looking for teams of two to five students from universities worldwide. What we want you to do is uh, project-based to design and implement a nature-based solution on your chosen site. So it's very open to that. You can look around you, you can uh, choose another site, you can do whatever you want to do, but just inspire us. and. Uh, to help you with that, during this webinar, you will see some examples of, okay, what can I do actually? What, what, what could be interesting for, uh, for us to uh, start the project with? You, uh, today we open uh, uh, the registration and we will close the registration until the third, uh, on the 13th of April. After that, we will select eight to 10 teams. And, and on the 10th of May, we will, make, we will announce those teams and those teams, they will start working on their projects. They will receive 2,500 euros and they will receive coaching and workshops. Then, very exciting, we have the finals in October and the win winning team will get exposure at the COP27, the Climate Summit in November. Uh, we are not doing this alone as Wageningen University. We are very happy with our partners. Uh, amongst others, there are Witveen and Bos and Arcadis. Those are two Dutch engineering companies, um, very much into nature-based solutions. Uh, uh, besides these partners, we also partner up with youth networks. We are very happy to do that. Uh, we have CSAYN, we have Youth and Landscapes, we have the Dutch uh, Youth Council, the NGR. Uh, in fact, Avi Fett will, uh, is a representative of the NGR and she will talk uh, during this webinar later. We have the International Association of Students in Agriculture and Related Sciences and we have the Future for Nature Academy. Thank you very much, uh, partners. So now it's time for me to hand over to uh, Tim van Hattem. He will tell you more about nature-based solutions and also a little bit more on what we expect, what the assignment is. Okay, Tim? Please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mirjam. Uh, so my name is uh, Tim van Hattem. I'm the program leader of the Green Climate Solutions Program at Wageningen University and Research. Uh, we study uh, the impact of climate change and we study uh, nature-based solutions um, and how to get there. And um, well, and this challenge is all about nature-based solutions. Um, at Wageningen, we developed a vision of how our country, the Netherlands, could look like in, the, in 100 years if we apply nature-based solutions on a very large scale. Um, many people think that our country will be flooded in 100 years, but we think if we apply nature-based solutions on a very large scale worldwide, the Netherlands will look at, uh, at this picture on the right. And what we want to do is create a nature-based future together, together with all of you. And we have to start implement these nature-based solutions. 
So I'll explain what nature-based solutions are and um, what the challenge is about. But I would like to start with um, today. Well, this picture is representing the world today. You could say the world is on fire and, um, well, we are still playing a, a game of golf. Um, and we know that we are facing some very big challenges in the future. Um, and we are already in it. And one of these biggest challenges is, is climate change um, and loss of biodiversity. And that's also what the World Economic Forum is saying in their global risk reports. Their, their message is that climate change and loss of biodiversity are the biggest challenges um, uh, for the world economy in the next decade. So, um, well, we, we need to act. And that's also the message of the, the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. Yeah? They're talking about code red. We are uh, in the danger zone. And uh, well, climate change is not something from the, for, from the long term. We are already seeing the effects all over the world. Uh, we see wildfires, we see floods, we see droughts, and we see heat waves all over the world. Um, and even in the Netherlands, we had some very, very severe floods uh, last year uh, in the southern part of our country, uh, also in Germany and Belgium. And we see, um, we see these effects almost everywhere. Uh, but climate change is not the only problem. There it has been uh, a very big assessment of um, the state of biodiversity in the world. Um, and also there we are facing uh, code red. Um, our biodiversity is declining very fast and one million species are about to extinct. So we need to act. We need to, uh, to act and to have an integrated long term approach for dealing with climate change and loss of biodiversity. And we have to reduce the emissions. Uh, we have to also adapt to the impact of climate change that is already there. And we are already in a 1.2 degree warmer world um, and we see the effects. So we also need to adapt to the impact of climate change and we have to restore biodiversity. And we have to do that in an integrated way. And we all know the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that have been um, um, decided to focus on uh, in the world. Um, but the picture on the right is showing that the biosphere, the Sustainable Development Goals that are dealing with uh, life on land, life in water, the availability of water and climate change adaptation and mitigation, if we don't deal with these um, um, sustainable development goals, we will never reach the others. So we need a healthy biosphere. And that's where nature-based solutions come in. Um, actually, um, our soils, our water systems, our forests, our wetlands are the biggest uh, climate solution. And we sometimes seem to forget. We are focusing a lot on technical solutions like wind energy, solar energy, uh, electric cars. We need all of these solutions, but we also need to start working with nature. Protecting and restoring nature is one of the biggest climate solutions uh, and one of the most promising climate solutions that we have. So uh, that's what we call nature-based solutions. And we have to start implementing these nature-based solutions on a very large scale. Well, to give you a definition of what we see as nature-based solutions, these are actions to protect, sustainably manage, restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Well, that's a lot, but... Um, there's a lot of debate also about nature-based solutions because it's not an excuse for not reducing carbon emissions. So there have been um, from the scientific literature um, four guiding principles for designing robust and resilient nature-based solutions. And these are very important not to make it an excuse for not doing the other things. So nature-based solutions are not a substitute for rapid phase out of fossil fuels. Nature-based solutions 
involve a wide range of ecosystems. It's not just forests, but it's also land and ocean ecosystems. Nature-based solutions are implemented with the full engagement of indigenous and local indigenous people and local communities. So we have to in, 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 um, involve local communities in implementing these nature-based solutions. And they should be designed to create benefits also for biodiversity, not only for storage of carbon, but also for um, improving biodiversity. If we work and implement nature-based solutions worldwide, uh, based on these four guiding principles, the world will, um, well, improve a lot. And that's exactly what this challenge is about. Well, uh, this is a picture of the Netherlands um, um, from the sky. Eh? You see a, a, a low-lying uh, country, vulnerable, vulnerable for the impact of climate change, uh, sea level rise, floods, droughts, heat waves, we have them all. We are one of the dense, most densely populated countries in the world. Uh, so we need to act and we need a vision of how our future looks like. And well, we created this vision, a nature-based future for our country. And we can create a nature-based future um, for any country in the world. And we want to start doing it, not just visualizing uh, and creating visions for the future, but we have to start and act today. And that is what the Nature-Based Solutions Challenge is about. So what we want you to do is start implementing a nature-based solution in your area. Um, you have to explain what a problem is um, and what problem you will solve by this nature-based solution. Um, and how it will contribute to uh, reducing the impact of climate change, um, improving biodiversity, and improve um, human uh, society. Well, you, do, you will have to do that by uh, a team of students, uh, two to five students uh, together. Um, and, um, well, you have to hand in a plan how to do that. And, um, well, we will select uh, eight to ten teams starting to do that. Eight to ten teams will get um, two and a half thousand euros of funding to start implementing this nature-based solution. Um, there's a concept note. Um, it's downloadable if I understood it right at this moment. Um, there's a link to the to the website in the chat. And there in this in this concept note you have to explain why, how and what um, of the project. So the pro problem definition, the vision about the project site, how you want to improve it by a nature-based solution, what nature-based solution um, you will implement, how that will look like, and how that will contribute to solving the problem. Um, also explain about the budget, yeah? how the budget, um, how much money you need to start implementing it, um, the timeline, the planning, and of course, a picture of your team. Eh? You, we want to know who will start doing the work. Uh, and this is my last slide. Um, um, we will select the projects along a certain criteria eh? because, um, well, we expect a lot of teams starting started to working um, start working on these nature-based solutions. And we will have to make a selection of eight to 10 projects that will get a go to, 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 uh, to start implementing these nature-based solutions. Um, so we will, um, the criteria will be that we look at the impact of your project, um, dealing with climate adaptation, climate mitigation, biodiversity, human well-being, economy, uh, maybe other, some other benefits. Uh, and the more benefits, it will have uh, the higher the score. And we will also look how feasible your project is eh? because it must be uh, doable uh, and we must believe that you really can implement this project. We will also look at the scale. Eh? It can be at different scales, uh, small scale, uh, larger scale. Um, well, we, we will have a look at that and, and see how, um, 
um, uh, how this project will contribute to to solving a problem. Um, and these four guiding principles um, I presented as a as a boundary condition as as a guiding principle for a good nature based solution. We will also look at that. Um, so. I hope this is clear. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, um, ask us, um, download the concept node and start uh, creating teams to start implementing nature-based solution on, on a very uh, worldwide scale because uh, we have to start acting and nature-based solutions are a very big part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, you, you talked about the criteria. You can find these criteria also on the website and also a link to the uh, four guiding principles. So you can all read it and so you, know, you are informed. So, yeah. um, thank you very much, Tim. I will, uh, yeah, I will announce the next uh, speaker. And yeah, if you have questions to Tim, please put them in the chat. He'll be back on screen and then he will answer your questions later. Thank you. So I want to introduce to you now to our next speaker, which is uh, Saroy Yakami. He works for Meta Meta. Hello, Saroy. He's uh, currently in uh, Nepal. He will tell you yeah. more about uh, Green Roads for Water to inspire you in your future, your own future projects. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mariam. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Saroy Yakami. I'm working with the Meta Meta. Uh, since 2014 as contract manager in Nepal. So uh, Meta Meta is a social enterprises uh, working in water, agriculture, environment management. So we contribute with the practical solution and introduce these at the scale. So, uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Wagan University for organizing this webinar. So today we will be talking about uh, green roads for water. So uh, uh, often, uh, uh, when we speak with the uh, road people or engineers, they say roads and water are generally seen as an enemies, as uh, it affects the hydrology of entire areas because they block and guide water. These roads block and guide waters. They also concentrate runoffs, while they also interfere with the subsurface flows, and they also change flooding pa flooding patterns. So that results into a flooding water logging, erosion, and sedimentation. So in the process, road itself get damaged. So uh, our study shows that on an average, there are 13 to 25 problem spots along 10 kilometer stretch of the road. So uh, these can be turned around and a uh, road can be a friend, road and water can be a friend. That the green roads for water incorporates Actually incorporates water management and regreening in the design and construction of road. Apart from protecting road and securing uh, transport, uh, green roads are instrument for climate resilience, uh, better water management, and it's a regreening. So these are the things we look at the uh, uh, green roads for water, like uh, uh, meet climate resilience roads, it's protect roads and secure transport, what I've already mentioned. So let's uh, look at the level of uh, road climate resilience we are uh, thinking about. Uh, a green roads for water uh, takes adaptive and proactive measures. If you see this one in the green side, uh, uh, take adaptive and protect measures for uh, road residents. Uh, adaptive in terms of uh, taking measures during road maintenance and rehabilitation in the existing roads and uh, protective in terms of incorporating measures during road design and construction phases. So uh, we, we, th th this table shows uh, a level of road climate resilience at, at different geographies. We can, uh, this can be also found in a guideline we will, uh, we have a uh, link for the guidelines in at the, our last slides. You can look at the guidelines. So, so actually, Green Roads for Water program uh, was instituted by Meta Meta in 2014, uh, started in Ethiopia, with the aim that uh, to have roads systematically used for water management, regreening, and climate resilience. And our 
our main idea is to uh, introduce this in at least 50% of countries in the world by 2025. So we have a um, lot of the uh, organizations supported for this Green Rule for Water, uh, World Bank, uh, NWO, uh, a GRP, so some of them are listed here. And then uh, at present, it is active in uh, 10 countries and uh, it reached to the 6 million people already. Uh, so, misses for Green Road, uh, different reasons, yeah. <clears throat> so, we, we see uh, measures related to water harvesting, uh, like uh, diverting water from roads to water harvesting structures, field, uh, percolation ponds and pits, and th this water can be used for productive purposes or in the recharging the aquifers. And, you, and this can, using roads to control water level and uh, flood shelters. Uh, I mean, this can be used at different geographies, like in the flood plain and lowland areas. And it's about protection of the spring seeps and streams during the road development. So especially in case of hilly and mountain areas, we can uh, use these measures. And roadside tree plantings in all geographies. So, uh, this intervention can be applied at different level, uh, at this landscape level to the spot interventions. Uh, we have a very successful example of a green roads for water approach from Ethiopia, where uh, green roads for approach has been adopted as a national policy in Ethiopia, and road water harvesting has been incorporated into the annual national watershed campaign. So in the process, this happened in Tigray region of Ethiopia, a series of infiltration pits, percolation ponds, and swells that collect uh, road runoff constructed on roadside filled by local farmers. So this is, uh, you can see some kind of pits and the recharge pits in the pictures. And then uh, in, during the campaign, there are a lot of people uh, participated in this Green Road for Water campaign. So, uh, the major, these measures undertaken under Green Road for Water in Tigray region uh, have a, a good impact on the increased groundwater table along Makale Road of the Ethiopia. So uh, here, uh, the water from the culvert were diverted to the farmland along the roadsides. And in the graph, you can see uh, the intervention, the in, actually the in, intervention was started in 2013. And the data from 2013 to 18 shows the increased percent of moisture in the farmland. Uh, you can see a weekly data uh, on the right side uh, of the uh, graph. Uh, and then on the left side, you can see increased groundwater table uh, in between the year 2013 to 18. So uh, with the, this intervention, uh, the soil moisture is increased uh, in the soil, and then there is increase in ground table groundwater table. And now I'm going to uh, explain you some of the examples of uh, a nature-based solution we have incorporated in the uh, green roads for water. The first picture with the uh, with the vehicle on the road, uh, you can see uh, returning these structures. It's called a road drift, non-vented road drift. <clears throat> it is retaining water on the upstream side of the uh, road itself. Uh, this has helped to increase the water table in the upstream areas, and it has also helped in increased biodiversity in those areas, in the areas around the road sites. Uh, I mean, in the picture, you can see uh, actually the riverbed is raised in the upstream side of this road. While uh, on the second picture at the uh, uh, right down, uh, left down, sorry. The water from the road drainage uh, is moved to the uh, farmland uh, by a simple uh, tools like uh, like kind of like structures. Such intervention increases soil moisture and groundwater along the roadside farmlands. So uh, it's all about how to manage water uh, from the road. In the third picture, you see uh, people uh, planting uh, uh, trees at the roadsides, and the uh, the actual use of this is to protect uh, 
protection from the road dust along the farmland and along the uh, settlement areas. So uh, here uh, you, in, in the pictures uh, in the left top corner, you can see a woman uh, going to the well. Uh, and the, in the well, the water is fed from the uh, roads. So uh, these, uh, even in the small quantities, these are a lifeline for farmers. It helps to grow uh, vegetables, which is not the case otherwise. I mean, with, the, with this intervention, they have, uh, it helps to collect a little bit of water that can, they are using for the uh, vegetable productions, and it's good for their livelihood purpose as well. Uh, and the second one, where uh, uh, raised road embankment, where you can see uh, water collected at the embank roadside embankment and the road embankment, and this is the water for research and agriculture nearby. So. Uh, you can grow your vegetable on time when you have water nearby. So, and the third one is uh, here you, you see a two women uh, carrying a water and uh, behind them there is a burrow pit now used as a uh, water storage. Uh, during the road construction, uh, we can see a number of burrow pits constructed along the road, road length. And the, the material are used for road construction from these burrow pits and these burrow pits are turned into the water storage so now water is easily accessible for the people living around which was not the case beforehand and on the last picture you see a series of uh, uh, recharge structures that are constructed along the roadside and they're actually to store water from the road and a drain and actually this helped to increase the ground water table and then the water is readily available for people uh, near doing agriculture. So th these are very uh, simple uh, techniques and tools used in the uh, Greenwich for water reference. And uh, now I uh, we have done some of the uh, work in the uh, plain area and in the mountain area. These are some, of, now I will be starting some of the uh, nature-based solution uh, we that can be useful for the hill and mountain areas. You can see uh, a retaining wall and the water coming out uh, from the uh, whip holes. Actually, that is a spring water. Uh, I mean, then, then I, you should know that spring water is the main source of water for uh, drinking, domestic, and agricultural use in hill and mountain areas. Uh, the, the, the spring and seeps are opened up, uh, disturbed uh, by the root development, and most, most of the time they are not taken care of. And these <clears throat> But, but we can uh, manage it by uh, simple tools to collect it, uh, protect it by constructing spray boxes and channel it by road crossing such as fence mattresses and pipes. Um, uh, actually, the management of uh, springs helps to strengthen the road by protecting road surfaces it itself and the water can be stored or used uh, for domestic as well as productive uses. Uh, the, the, actually, this table shows some of the uh, a spring management and the use of it. For instance, spring with a concentrated discharge can also be used for domestic water supply and storage. Uh, required that require spring boxes and conveyance uh, means to benefit community living along the roadsides. Also, the same uh, spring can be used for agriculture purposes uh, that require uh, some uh, techniques like retaining wall with the longitudinal drain to collect excess water and uh, traverse it, such as French mattresses underneath uh, the road. Uh, <clears throat> the water can be collected in the ponds. Actually, uh, we can also share some of our uh, documents we have prepared uh, for spring management. We have developed a guideline for that. We can also share with you. That can help you a lot. And, and, and you can see a number of pictures and sketches in this document. Uh, excuse me, uh, you still have two minutes. Okay, thank you, I'm almost. So some of the other measures are uh, uh, controlled road water crossing uh, on a regular stream and torrents. So, uh, so examples are dissipation blocks and tilted causeways that will break the water speed and safety guide and cross water to drown or drown them respectively with no damage to the road. So material requires are coarse stone 
available during the road construction. I mean, I'm talking about the hill and mountain areas. So on the, on the right side, you can see the water harvesting from roads uh, that guides water or uh, spraying water to the area of use. The water can be collected in lined storage pond, like concrete, plastic, or clay ponds. And the water contributes to horticulture and other crops in the roadside farmlands. Uh, and, and in this section, we are talking about the slope protection and water retention by using a spoil, uh, which will reduce the risk of erosion, degradation, and forest ill slopes, and help in regrading. For example, uh, the eyebrows on the right side, uh, the skate, <clears throat> they are semicircular wall uh, made up of abundant spoil like stone and open in the runoff direction. It has an infiltration pit at the center, high density use of this measure will capture soil and debris for regrading in the areas. And on the left side, you can see some visited measures to protect the roadside slopes. Uh, especially uh, it uses of the bamboos that is locally available grass and locally available grass which has capacity to hold the spoils. So uh, uh, th this is uh, most probably I'll explain the last slide. Uh, this has created a lot of livelihoods like uh, they get a lot of jobs over the time now when we are uh, doing the green roads for water technologies and it also helps to uh, generate income for the people. So two things that, that can generate is, one is employment opportunities and on, another is income generation from this uh, work. And other thing, this slide shows some of the uh, benefit of the uh, cost benefit of the uh, cost and benefit from the green roads for water in Ethiopia, where uh, it has a lot of uh, saving in uh, routine maintenance uh, and periodic maintenance. Uh, it, it is well explained in the guideline we have uh, uh, attached in the next uh, next slide. So, so uh, yeah, actually our mission is to make green roads for a uh, standards, uh, systematically use of water management and uh, to work with organizations to adopt and support the same practice and to fast track climate change adaptations. So this is a guideline what uh, I'm talking about. And then you can uh, download the guideline through the link given below over here. And these are the related other sources uh, uh, linked to green roads for water. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Saroy. I think the links that you showed us, we can uh, we can share them with the participants later. Uh, and you can also add some in the chat. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. And I'm sure it has sparked a lot of uh, the students' minds to uh, that they have some ideas now where their projects can go to. Um, uh, again, if you have questions for Saroy, please put them in the chat because we will answer them later. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I want to introduce our next, uh, our next speaker. And that is uh, Evi Fett. She is a student at Wageningen University, but also the UN Youth Representative on Biodiversity and Food for the Dutch, uh, for the Netherlands. And uh, well, please, Evi, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Miriam. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a fit. I am, as Miriam said, the Dutch UN Youth Representative on Biodiversity and Food. And I am a student in Nutrition and Health at the Wageningen University. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about my work today um, as a UN Youth Representative and how nature-based solutions is intertwined with my work. I go to um, the UN conferences, which all have to do with nature and our food system. I went to the United Nations Food System Summit and um, the Water Energy Food Nexus in Dubai. And I will be going to the Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming this year, if it will happen. I am uh, looking forward to it. And the, my job as a youth representative is gathering all the information from the Dutch youth to understand how they feel about our food system, how they feel about our impact on biodiversity and how the Netherlands is, um, their policy is doing. And to tell the Dutch ministry and to tell the United Nations how we feel about this. And I think it is super important because the youth is creative and can think outside of the boxes of policies and law 
but also it is our future, our future, and the persons at the position of the policymakers and at UN level that are speaking right now are mostly 50 plus white males probably deciding on our our future and this should and could be different and this is why i am assigned as a youth representative but i am specifically assigned as biodiversity and food and i shortly want to talk about why these two uh, topics are linked and why i'm assigned to this specific topic but biodiversity you may have heard from it and you might even know what it means, but it is all organisms within one ecosystem that link are linked together by enhancing their presence. They can't live without each other. And if you take away too many organisms, one ecosystem can fall apart. And such an organism can look like an animal or a large tree, but also fungi or bacteria in the soil. And why is this linked to food? This is because a flourishing biodiversity in an ecosystem takes care of clean water, um, fresh air, medicines, and also food production. Without biodiversity, our food system is maybe even not present and mostly not sustainable at all. So we need biodiversity for a sustainable food production. And this is also why both topics are equally important because we are dealing with biodiversity losses while also having to feed the planet. I wanted to show you uh, an example of how I link these two in order to understand the importance of nature and food production. And I will do this through the example of the banana. The banana is the example of unsustainable food production. And I think you will know the banana. This is the Cavendish banana and it is sold world worldwide, imported from all over the world. And I'm now talking from a Dutch perspective, but we eat a lot of bananas, but we don't grow them. So we have to import them. And this is the only banana that's in our supermarkets. And I'm not sure, but I think that it's the only banana in most supermarkets all over the world that need to import their bananas. But this larger banana, the Gros Michel, was our banana. It's larger and it's even sweeter. Why did we change from the Cavendish to the Gros Michel or the other way around? Why did we change from the Gros Michel to the Cavendish? Well, to tell you, we need to go back in time and a long time ago at the time that we were hunters and gatherers at this moment we ate the wild type banana this is the original form of a um, fruit or a vegetable that is found in the wild it's called the wild type of course and this is what the wild type of banana looks like this is probably the Cavendish or the Gros Michel, I'm not sure. Next to the wild type, it has many black large seeds and not a lot of flesh. Of course, the hunter-gatherers weren't that interested in this type of banana because it wasn't that easy to eat. It's just all inside of the banana. And through domestication and through crossbreeding, so not genetically modifying, but just breeding, we got a seedless banana, which is great because they are bigger, they don't have seeds. Yeah, and we now have a very large sweet fruit. But what happens if, you, if your fruit doesn't have any seeds? How do you propagate? How do you make new banana trees from a banana from, that doesn't have seeds? Well, you clone them. So you take one piece of a banana tree, you put them back in the soil, and the exact same tree comes out of it. This is cool, but it means that all over the world, the same tree is planted. So the Cavendish banana that we eat, that is planted in um, South America, but also in Asia, is the exact same at opposite sides of the world. 
because there is only one genetic genetic type of the banana. And this is also what it looks like. It's a monoculture. And in a monoculture, there aren't that many, that isn't that many biodiversity because it only has bananas. Um, um, a monoculture is highly susceptible to pests and insects and disease. And this is also what happens in the banana in the Gros Michel. It got the TR4 disease and it spreads through the soil and it worsens through monocultures. But in banana, it's even worse because if one banana can get is susceptible, susceptible for the disease, then every banana is susceptible because they are genetically identical. And what happened is that it spread not only on one field, but all over the world. And it would have been the end of the banana as we know it, because the, the farmers, they just abandoned their fields and um, they cut down rainforests to make more banana fields, but the TR4 disease came back. And it would have been the end if we didn't accidentally found the Cavendish. Um, we oh they they do need a lot to spray a lot to uh, prevent the TR4 disease to contaminate, which is not only very bad for the soil, but it's also expensive. So we now have the Cavendish banana, which is also a clone all over the world, and now it's happening exactly the same in the Cavendish. So what happens in the Gros Michel is now happening in, in the Cavendish as well with the black Sikatoka disease. We don't have a solution yet because the bananas that we want to import, um, we need a banana that's easable, easy to import. And there are many variety, varieties of bananas around the world, but they're not that um, good for transport or not the same as the banana we know of. So what can we do? Well, there are nature-based solutions for bananas. For instance, there is a new um, report on intercropping banana trees with Chinese chives. And if you do this, the Chinese chives enhance biodiversity and act as a protective border against the Black Sea Katoga. And similar and other nature-based solution is a biopesticide. A biopesticide is a natural um, protection, like an like a yeah, it acts against the disease, but it's natural because it has um, biological a biological nature. And in this case, fungi are the basis of the biopesticides. So we found, well, I say we, but the scientists found a fungi that can act against the black cicatoka. And if you use this within a banana field, it could aid in the protection. And it could mean um, we could still eat some bananas in the future. These are only just examples of how we could use nature-based solutions for the protection of bananas. There are many, many other solutions probably because I know we have managed to uh, breed a Dutch banana in a greenhouse um, in Wageningen. But of course, this isn't the same as a land grown banana from uh, uh, South Africa, uh, South America, for instance. But uh, yeah, this is something I would love to see. Oh, sorry. I would love to see you do as well. Like, how could you use nature and nature solutions for very large and very important solutions, uh, very large and uh, problems in the world? And I'd love to hear from you. And this is why I feel biodiversity and food is important. And I can't wait to hear your solutions. Thanks a lot, uh, AV, for this very interesting and uh, inspiring presentation. Thank you. Um, 
now it's actually time for the Q&A. So I would like to ask all presenters from today to turn on the camera so you're all visible again. And well, yes, nice to see you all again, right? Um, and it's time for the Q&A. So I would like to ask all the participants to put their questions, which they might have on one of the presentations or on the challenge in the chat. And then I will address them to the speakers. Well, I uh, already received some questions. And the first question I would like to direct to Miriam because it's really about the challenge. And that question is about whether you uh, should really be located yourself at the project site on which you will work with your nature-based solutions project. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, did, did you introduce yourself and our new face, uh, Anastasia? Uh, no, not yet. I will first you are too floor, modest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so first Anastasia and then I will introduce. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Anastasia and I'm working at Meta Meta. I'm um, coordinating the Green Roads for Water activities that we have worldwide and Sarah's uh, presented you about. Thank you. So, um, my name is David and I'm um, studying in, at Wageningen International Land and Water Management. And I'm also helping in organizing the Nature Based Solutions Challenge. Uh, and Miriam already presented about the youth networks, which are really actively involved in the challenge, uh, such as the NJR, from which AV uh, is representing today. And I'm very active in the International Association for Students in Agriculture. And now, now it's really time to, uh, to <laughs> post the first question to Miriam. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, uh, the question about the site, uh, you can choose a site uh, outside your own country. But uh, yeah, take into mind that in the concept notes and also the jury criteria, we, we look at feasibility. So it will be quite difficult, maybe, to uh, implement a project that's outside your own region. Um, but maybe you have some, yeah, some very nice ideas that it is possible. So uh, yeah, just go ahead. So it is, you can, you are allowed to do it, but keep this thing in mind. Um, I think there are some, I saw some uh, familiar uh, names in the participants list. Uh, there was a team last year from Nepal. Uh, they worked on uh, bio, bio organic apples in the Joomla region in Nepal. And for them to travel to their uh, project site, yeah, it took them, I think, two, two days. They made a, a remarkable uh, road trip movie so that we all enjoyed, but it was really hard for them to reach it. And that's, so we, we are looking at feasibility here in this case. I hope this answers the question. I think it is a very key answer. So indeed, uh, if you have an amazing plan and then you can, can surely make it work, but consider that it should be feasible. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. And actually, I would like to ask you another question, and that is about <laughs> the process of teaming up with other students. Um, how does that work? Should you make your own groups? Uh, will we pro provide them some uh, help in forming the teams? Or, well, that was actually the question. Um, uh, no, you can. You have to form your own teams of two to five persons. Uh, you don't have to be all from the same university, though. So you can team up with uh, with uh, uh, students from other universities. Um, is is there a lot of demand for uh, this? Are there a lot of? Maybe you can put in the chat if you are uh, if you want to team up with somebody, and then people, other participants can see you in the chat. That could be a way to uh, to make a team, but we don't really facilitate this, this challenge. Yeah. So okay. Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, we have to uh, attendance lists. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah it, it, it's it, it's a question that we really uh, yeah we don't have a real answer yet. Uh, I, I understand the question. Maybe you are uh, on your own and you are really interested in joining. You are looking for team members. Um, so I see already somebody uh, reaching out in the chat. We might yes. have we we yeah okay. Daft and I we will discuss if we if we can facilitate in one way or the other. We all have your email addresses uh, and then. Uh, We'll come up with something. We are we are also very uh, flexible. <laughs> yeah. So in the in the email that you will receive sometime after this webinar, we will for sure come back to this point and see uh, yeah. how we can help in this. And I already see some very uh, active suggestions in the chat. So well, uh, great. And uh, maybe if there are also some content specific questions on the nature based solutions presented by the teams, then these are also more than welcome, of course. And. Um, there is again a practical question, and that's about the maximum budget. Um, 
Well, the budget provided in this challenge is only for the eight to 10 selected teams and it's 2,500 euros. Um, yeah, so that, that's the, also the maximum budget actually, <laughs> because that's the budget. Um, let me see if there are other questions coming in. Well, they are all about the uh, process of teaming up. So I think it would be good if we come back to that after the webinar, which we will do. Um, are there any questions to our experts? This is your chance. Or maybe one expert has a question to another expert. <laughs> Actually, I have a question for uh, for Tim from the audience, uh -huh. and the question is about uh, climate and biodiversity uh, and food. And the question is about whether you should select uh, a topic, or uh, or you should focus on everything that's kind of presented today. Is that clear, Tim? <laughs> Well, the, the more integrated, the better. Um, but um, of course, we understand if you have a very great nature-based solution that is uh, focusing on uh, mainly on climate adaptation and biodiversity, for instance, but not on climate mitigation, then it's also fine. So, um, so uh, make it as integrated as possible, uh, but you don't have to deal with everything. And maybe one um, additional remark I would like to make because we uh, presented some examples of nature-based solutions. Uh, nature-based solutions is, is a very broad um, yeah, uh, topic actually, uh, but we presented mainly some examples from the rural areas. Eh? We talked about bananas and we saw this green, great uh, uh, green road initiative. But you can also apply nature-based solutions in urban areas uh, a lot and there's a lot of debate about it. And um, well, that would be also great to see some uh, some um, examples implemented in in, um, in urban areas. Uh, so creating much more green spaces, uh, green roofs, green facades, uh, rain gardens, uh, all these kinds of solutions we also call nature-based solutions, and they are also part of this challenge, according to me. But I hope also according to the <laughs> organizers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tim, for uh, making that point also. Great, thank you. And then there is a question from Yuma on whether the webinar is being recorded and whether it will be able to watch it again. Well, I can answer that question. It is recorded and you will be able to watch it again. So that's nice. And then you can indeed share it to potential team members. Uh, great. And then my question to Miriam, whether local organizations can be involved in the challenge for the implementation phase? Yes. Definitely, we encourage that even um, to make your project work. It's very good to team up with uh, with stakeholders in your neighborhood. So we, uh, it's even a question in the format of the concept note that's on the website. I shared a link to the registration form, and on that page, uh, maybe we can share it again in the chat. Uh, on that page, you also see the format of the concept note that you have to fill in to participate. And actually, one of the uh, questions is about: Are you already? involved with uh, stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, so indeed, so it's actually a, a plus when you work together with state, surely with uh, stakeholders and potentially also with organizations and institutes. So yeah, good question. And uh, indeed, it's already part of the concept out, which we, uh, well, me and will point out a bit more uh, while closing the webinar. And um, I don't see new questions coming in. So if there is still a question, then Put it in the chat really quickly or get back to us after the webinar. So then, um, does one of the speakers still have a, a contribution or something that he or she would like to add? Uh, something that he missed or a last note? And otherwise, Liam can uh, do the closure. Like we're discussing and like, you know, um, yeah, would be available. Thanks. Yeah, that's really nice, Anastasia. Thank you. Then uh, yeah. I would like to give the floor to Miriam. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to all the presenters for uh, your contributions, and also now, yeah, we we will get in. Uh, we will still be in contact later because it's it's very nice offer of Meta Meta. Well, Tim is one of the initiators of this uh, challenge, so we'll meet him surely again. Uh, Avi is so uh, is a partner of the youth networks. So we will all still be involved. And uh, I think it's uh, a characteristic of this uh, challenge that we really want people to interact with each other and share knowledge and share also enthusiasm and energy in this topic. 
So thank you very much, presenters. Um, I will uh, give some uh, some final remarks, and then uh, yeah, this webinar is already getting to its end. Start my. Uh... Oh. So um, we will. Um, oh yeah. So the presenters, maybe if you uh, of your videos and <laughs> slowly uh, <laughs> appearing. This is uh, the first. Of webinar, and but there's good news. We have three more webinars uh, before the registration closes, with many more examples. And we organize these three follow-up web webinars with our youth network partners. Uh, on the first of March, we have a webinar with the Future for Nature Academy on uh, nature-based solutions to achieve human-wildlife coexistence. Very interesting. On the 11th of March, we have a webinar during the conference of the International Association of Students in Agriculture and, and uh, Related Sciences. It's called Nature-Based Solutions in Future Cropping Systems. Then the last one is on the 23rd of March, on, uh, that's organized by the Youth in Landscapes, Nature-Based Solutions, the Good, the Bad and the Youth Perspective. During these webinars, we will also be open to questions about the challenge itself and about the procedure. We will share uh, the links to these webinars in the follow-up email tomorrow. So the applications, you, they are open from now on. Uh, this is really the kickoff and the, um, yeah, the deadline is the in 13th of April, nine o'clock in the morning, Europe time. Liam, actually, I would like to interrupt you for one final question. And that is yes. whether the project should be physical or whether an app related to nature-based solutions awareness could also be an idea. Oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good question actually because uh, both are uh, eligible. Um, you can do either a physical project that you start digging or you start building things, or you can do something in awareness. And yeah, an app could be an example for that. I think this uh, answers the question. Um, yeah, to conclude, um, this is the time path. We have the kickoff event that was today. We have the webinars coming up that I just showed. And the deadline is the 13th of April. After that, we start selecting and the final selection will be announced on the 10th of May. Then the, the 10 teams, they will start working uh, from May to October. In October, we have a finals and we work towards uh, the COP27 in November, where the winning team can get some exposure on, on, the, on their projects. Um, yeah, so this is it. Uh, thank you so much all for your attention and hope to see you in the upcoming webinars. Hope to see your registration. Hope to see you as a team uh, that will uh, start the heavy work and, uh, and interact with us. And um, yeah, for this, for now, uh, the webinar is closed. And uh, thank you very much.